Ian Fraser. Ian, are you out there? What am there I writing the text for? Buddy? 159. I'm always one minute early, and he's the first man in the door. I love this. Might just the quickest person on the draw thus far. There he is. Okay. How are you, my man? Good and yourself, bud. I'm good. I'm good. Is it, What's uh, going on? Is it a bit chilly up there? No, I, this has probably been the first week of spring-like weather we've had, Andrew. Oh, okay. Tell us up a little bit. Um, so we're we're kind of low fifties um, as it would be measured in the US. We're kind of maybe fourteen, fifteen degrees. That's not nice. pretty good. Pretty good. Yeah. No snow. So um, it's the only the only thing keeping us off the the golf courses right now is is just the the mandatory lockdown. Yeah. So. We would normally be well ahead of the game uh, going into the season this year. So, what can we do? What can we do? We can be thankful for good weather. We're we're going to be ready for it when the time comes. That that's for sure. Yes. How are you guys doing down there? Yes, uh, we're doing okay, mate. Some of the golf courses are still open. Okay. So, um, you know, I know when I drive by, there's. Uh, there's a lot of action going on out there, but uh, yeah. good to see that there's a lot of golf carts. I drove past I the course uh, in um, South Carolina today, and there were four golf carts and four singles in each cart. Well, that's that's good to hear. I mean, it, you know, you, you don't know what to think when you hear golf courses are still open. It's hard yeah. to think, it, it, is that irresponsible? And people are maybe just treating this as time off where they can go and get a game with their friends, or are they just getting some fresh air like everyone's allowed to? Um, yeah, it's difficult. It's really, it's really kind of murky waters. I don't really think anyone knows quite what to do with it. It is. There seems to be two kinds of ends of the spectrum. You know, the people who are, okay, let's go and play golf. I'm not going to touch you. You're not going to touch me. I've right. got my own stuff. Um, and then the people who are saying, we'll lock everything down. You know, know. everyone's I being know. Re irresponsible by going out there. So. It's hard, um, isn't it? I mean, really it, get into that. yeah, I know, I know. That's that's the thing. That's the thing. It's you know, people will do what they do, but we're only responsible for ourselves. Correct, correct. And Ian, you know, I, I put uh, about thirty minutes ago on on Twitter. I said, Ian is the best golf instructor that I've ever been associated with, or been around, or spent time with. Um, and, and I can honestly say this: if I taught a kid who was uh, 13 years old, and they started to get really good, 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 and they made it to the PGA Tour, um, you would be my guy. You would be their guy, because you're the person that I would direct them to for all their equipment stuff, all their equipment questions and needs, um, and certainly we would communicate, and, and yeah. you would be cool with that. Uh, yeah. But really, you are the man when I think of club fitting, mate. Well, that's that's a huge, huge honor for me to hear that from someone like you. And um, I mean, I think club fitting is is still in in a really, uh, really much in its infancy in a way, Andrew. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I, I feel like there's so much depth in the instruction and teaching because the PGM programs, the PGA programs, they lead you towards the clubs or, or coaching. No one's really leading anyone towards club fitting as a viable option out of out of that. So when I when I kind of graduated from the PGA in two thousand and two back in the UK at Birmingham University, I kind of went, well, what what is the route where I can sort of separate myself from the rest? Yeah, I, I'm going to have a hard time doing it with with coaching. There's so many good coaches. Um, you know, I didn't really see myself uh, in the the club pro route, and I went, I love equipment. And, and I really see the, the difference that, you know, the right fitting, the right equipment can make to someone's game instantly. And yeah. I have a huge passion for that. So I think, you know, staying on a very narrow path and going very deep down that path has really served me well. And um, it's, it's worked out pretty good so far. That's a great point. That's great advice for any young coach or any coach looking and listening in uh, is that, it's important for us, I think, to specialize. Mm -hmm. uh, I really try to make my specialty the everyday golfer. I want to yeah. present my information and communicate in such a way that the everyday golfer is going to go, ah, I got mm -hmm. that. I think I yeah. can do that. 
Uh, and it's so important, I think, for, for any golf coach to be, you know, a technical swing guru like a Dana Dahlquist or Phil Kenyon putting or short game, club fitting, exercise. There's so many different areas you can, you can slot yourself into. So true. And, you know, I, I, I love that you said that, that, that you're really trying to cater to really the, the widest part of that bell curve when it comes yeah. to, you know, the golfers out there. And, you know, I feel like we do a little bit of that here as well. And yeah. especially we've tried to do that with the YouTube channel, Andrew, is we're trying to kind of break down some of these difficult decisions and some of these, you know, maybe still misconceptions that are still, um, unfortunately, in our in our industry. Mm. Um, and, and we're trying to kind of break that down to stop people making those those sort of bad decisions and trying to play that middle middleman role. There's so much good information that the 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 R and D guys and and the the guys at Ping. I mean, they they lead the way. There's no question. Uh, mm. Doctor Paul and, and Eric lead the way, and Sasho with the work that they do. But you do such an amazing job at extracting that really technical stuff, and they do it as well. But you do it so mm. well. And then going, okay, here's here's how you know you can interpret that. There's there's actually a video of yours that that I mean I must have sent it to 150 people, at least 150. And when people leave here and they, they don't quite have the concept of wrist angles and they go, what what clubs can you give me that will help this wicked slice I've got? And I can just see them all the way through the session there there, yeah. and you know I go, listen, give me four minutes, let's watch this together. We're going to watch Andrew's video, and he'll talk about how to get the lead wrist into flexion early. And, you know, you don't want that T pointing back at your face. Okay. Let's understand that concept, and then let's go back in the bay, and let's see how we can turn the equipment that we think will work into the right ball flight without <laughs> trying to move lie angles and do, do stuff that really is too much of a Band-Aid. So that's credit to you. Thank you, mate. And I must say, because I've watched you do quite a few fittings over the years, Ian, and I think one of the hardest things for, for, for doing what you do mm -hmm. must be to look at a player who's just carving it out there. You know, they're flushing this driver yeah. like 184 yards, mm -hmm. um, swinging at 90 miles an hour, and you can see what they need. Yeah. But you've got to go, okay, let's fit you into this draw bias driver, you know, and, and it's, it, it would be a difficult line to walk, I suppose. Yeah, you gave me some brilliant advice on the range at Atlantic many, many years ago when you said to me that, Ian, you need to be 25% golf coach, 75% fitter. Mm -hmm. And you said of yourself, I need to be 75% coach, 25% fitter. So we yeah. both understand the role that the club is playing and the swing is playing and, and sort of where they overlap at the point where you can extract yourself from one role and and you know, temporarily place yourself in the other role. And I've always kept that to heart. And as I've built the team at TXG, I've made sure they've always understood that that's their role, that they can't purely try to fix every flaw with equipment. Yeah, that's a good point. That's a good point. Some of it is beyond equipment. Yeah, and, and, and you know, some people don't like to hear that. And you know, they, they want a shaft to yeah. fix everything. and. You know, they, they believe that the movable weight in their driver is the, the, the kind of key that's going to fix it. But, you know, those are those are things that will dial it down narrowly, but they're not going to be the, the, the fix of all flaws. Yeah. You know, I, I was talking to, uh, you must probably know this, I'm sure, Ian, but I was talking to Paul Wood yesterday. Mm -hmm. And I said, Paul, that movable weight in the channel on the back of the G410, yeah. I said, when you move that weight two inches towards the toe or two inches towards the heel, how mm -hmm. much does that move the center of gravity of that club? And he said, it's about a tenth of an inch. <laughs> I know, I know. It's like it's, a mil you know, yeah. it's like it's a hard, millimeter. And it's hard for people to, to get that concept when they're flipping weights on the drivers front and back. They go, well, I've got the CG all the way back now. Okay, and then if they start spinning a couple, I'm going to move that forward. I'm going to move that CG all the way forward that's going to make the world a difference when you know when we map the cg of drivers and and we we make little marks on the sole of the club so we can see how far that's moved and it's fractions fractions of fractions yeah. but they can but they count that's the other part you know these yeah. fractions count um you know when when the guys do the the things that they do and design and, and kind of make this weight adjustable it really does play a part and and i'm kind of always 
playing devil's advocate with the guy who thinks it does everything and the guy who thinks it does nothing. Yeah, you yeah. know, They're the answer somewhere in between. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ian, question for you, okay? And this, mm -hmm. I, I call you know, ever since it was almost like the first set of irons that I think you and Hoyt introduced me to them. Yeah, uh, they were these Epon irons mm -hmm. from a ah, long time ago, and sure. those seemed to be the first pretty much set of irons that were like whoa, these things are hot. You know, yeah. the ball was literally springing off the face. Mm -hmm. and so I call that technology face flex technology, for want yep. of a better term. Okay? Sure. Mm -hmm. In irons, and a lot of golfers don't know this, in irons you have face flex technology and you have just a piece of metal. Sure, yeah. Okay, where there's no face flexing going on and there's nothing being added to the golf ball. Mm -hmm. Um what speed, and let's say with the seven iron, yep. would you cut off a player's ability to choose between the two? At what speed with the seven iron would you say, there's no way I'm going to let you get those hot irons mm -hmm. because your speed is simply fast enough already. Yeah. Your ball speed is fast enough already. You hit the ball far enough already. Yeah, do not benefit from that. As a, as a really, really good one, and uh, you take yourself into the into the bay, and you, you try and picture that that customer who's who's swinging, and you go, okay, you've got enough to play this game well. You've got enough speed yeah. to play yeah. this game well, and and at this point for you, it's about uh, distance control, it's about repetition, and, and that mm -hmm. type of thing. And you know, I think if you're in the the eighty two, eighty three mile an hour range with seven iron, you know, 85-ish with six iron, you're, you're, you're pretty, you know, competent. You can hit it yes. probably about 165, 165, 170 with a six iron. So yeah. I think at, at that point, you probably lay off the, the real sort of hot faces when it comes I to love irons. That. I love, that's, that's a great answer. And, and I, I love how you structured it, uh, simply because what I say to my students is, listen, at this speed, yes, we would all like to be faster because every male says to me when they see their speed on track, man, they say, yeah, yeah you know, I'm normally faster. Mm. Okay, I used to be faster. We all used to be faster. We're all normally faster. It is what it is. Yeah. Uh, well, we can make it faster if need be. Mm -hmm. uh, but I look at them and I say, at this current speed, you're capable of shooting under par on any golf course you play as long as you're playing the appropriate tees. The appropriate tees, exactly. Yeah. Okay, it's like if you're not playing from 7,600 yards, mm -hmm. if you're playing from 6,600, you can shoot under par on any golf course you play with this yeah. speed. Mm -hmm. Then they go, okay, so what else do I need? You need to control your ball. We need to make it more uh, repetitive, more controllable. Then you're off to the races. Absolutely. Okay. Um, I, I think that's so important. I had a player the other day who went for a fitting. Um, they swing a seven iron at 93 miles an hour. Mm. Mm -hmm. which is fast. PGA Tour average is, you know, low 90s. Yeah. Um, and they came back with a set of face flex irons. And I said, and it was too late because they mm -hmm. made the purchase already. And I said, so why did you get these? And he looked at me and he said, I hit them six yards longer. Jeez. I said, so, so now you're hitting a seven iron like 190. He said, yes, yeah. like 188. He said, well, what's that going to do for you? Yeah. I know, I know, I know that that's the thing, isn't it? I mean, I, I feel like, and that's why I say earlier on that I feel like our industry or our little segment of, of, of golf is, is in its infancy because we still have to educate so much more, Andrew. Um, yeah. the, the club fitters out there, we, we have to get over distance being the, the be all mm. and end all. Um, yeah. You know, we have to understand how to sort of, make a set of 14 clubs all work for you in their own every club has its own job and its yeah. own role and it's just not a case of how far can we get everything to go it just just isn't yeah yeah the the uh the, the engineers at ping explained to me they said andrew um certain golf is always gonna you know if you hit a seven on 128 yards in the air yeah. you mm -hmm. need some help okay right. so that's what that technology is for but mm -hmm. they said if you have a 160-yard shot, it's not 
a nine iron challenge. It's not a seven iron challenge. It's not a five wood challenge. It's just mm -hmm. a 160 yard challenge. Select the tool that's going to allow you to be the most predictable yeah. as you deal with that challenge. Yeah, that, that's all it is. That's exactly all it is. And, and each club is, is, is just a tool. Whether it says a six on it, whether it says a seven on it, yeah. whatever, however it acts, it's, it's a tool for a job. And that's that's all these that's all these fourteen tools are to us. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And one of the things I wanted to talk about was um, I still recall this day very clearly. It was a long, long time ago, mm -hmm. and it was yourself and I and Hoyt McGarity, yeah, standing on the driving range at Berkeley Hall in Bluffton, South Carolina. Mm -hmm. And um, I came up with an idea and I said, guys, let's, because you guys have those connect things, I believe at the time. Yeah. And you could, we could take one shaft mm -hmm. and plug the shaft into two very different heads. Do you and remember so the, have, do you remember the heads? I don't remember the heads. So the, the blade was a 712 MB from Titleist. Okay. The, cavi the cavity was a Callaway X-Hot and the shaft was a Dynamic Gold X100. Okay. I remember the day as clear as it was yesterday. Very good. Very good. And we got Hoyt to hit three, and we changed it out, and he did three and three. And, you know, we didn't hit them all kind of consecutively. We tried yeah. to do it properly. And I know from my perspective, when mm -hmm. I looked at some of those numbers, yeah. I was like, I don't, I don't really understand how that has happened. And I don't think any of the three of us at the time understood Mm -hmm. what was going on i now believe that all three of us could be able to look <laughs> at that and go ah i get it yeah um what what can you share from that session if you recall it uh, I do. that that was so enlightening not at the time but now well, we we were taking clubs at the same lie angle at that mm -hmm. time and we were seeing such variance in and at the time I think we were measuring it by VSP on Trackman. Yeah, yeah, swing flex. Um, yeah, so we were looking at that, and the the cavity, I believe it was the cavity back was 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 really drooping on us, um, and and we were we couldn't kind of quite get our head around. It. If we get the same player to make the same delivery, and, and you know Hoyt is as good of a human robot as you and I could ever yeah. work with, and we have this we have just two different heads, but the same lie angle. What is it about those properties that make one significantly droop more than the other? And obviously, you know, there's now we know more about that stuff and, and more about CG placement and blade length and, and how the head influences the shaft in deflection. Yes. You know, we know more about that than, than ever before. I mean, we recently invested in Gears, uh, uh, Gears Golf to be able to figure out those types of things with our team because we need answers for these types of things. Why is it when you stand up with a player and do a gapping session, they hit all their short irons left and they hit all their long irons right as a right-handed player? Yeah. Because the amount of variance and droop is not consistent with, with those players. Yeah, yeah. And from speed to speed. Absolutely. And, and how they recruit speed, you know, being, being another factor. Because even when we're working on, you know, we use inside, we use GC quad and, the, the dynamic lie angle measurements are phenomenal. It's, it's yeah. one of the things I've, I've loved um, being a TrackMan user for nine years and then I moved over to Foresight. I was, I was pretty concerned about the, the kind of uh, methodology that I had developed for club fitting and moving into this other system. How is that going yeah. to change? We're measuring different parts of the face to get our club path and speed and these types of things. But as I've used more quad and, and seen dynamic lie angle, it's really influenced my, my fitting methodology. Mm -hmm. And being able to use both of those things has been interesting. But the one thing I know that I'm missing at times is the amount of contribution of vertical force that the player will apply. So when, when they're they are lifting up and they're raising the handle, yeah. I, I, I would love to know that is the four iron dripping more because they have more upward lift because they're trying to they're trying to hit a four iron further than a wedge. So yeah. how much is that vertical contribution mm. playing into the role that that handle started there, but at impact they're recruiting so much force that it ends up up there. Well, we're we're never going to do that with a wedge. It's a different job. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Yeah. And so um, regardless even of speed, mm -hmm. 
uh, which is going to alter the Drew. Um, it's the, you know, and it, it, it's it, it's the amount of vertical upward force pulling up on the club mm -hmm. to get that to, to, to work that way. And also, you know, another thing that's interesting, I always used to say to my students, you've only got to know two numbers. If you're a mm -hmm. serious golfer, you've got to know two numbers because you, you, you've heard this a thousand times. You say to someone, well, you know, what kind of specs have you got? Well, I'm yeah. standard length and two flat. Mm -hmm. From what? <laughs> From what, yeah. Because, uh, uh, and so I, I've really got on a push a long time ago. Mm -hmm. um, I want people to know that they're, the length they feel good with, mm -hmm. once you get that, Mm -hmm. is for me it's uh six iron 37.5 inches yep and a lie angle of 60.5 degrees right and i used to encourage everyone i want you to just know two numbers that's what yeah. walk in the door and say listen we don't have to do this part we got that that's what i like mm -hmm. that works best for me well here's the deal now now we've got not only do we have different as you said, blade length, mm -hmm. uh, which which is going to change that action coming through there. But yep. we've got also different shaft profiles that are going to allow that club to interact with the ground and that lie angle to be effectively different um, from club head to club head and shaft to shaft. Yeah. And yeah, so true. Number to number, really. And there's there's so many variables involved in that, and that's one of the things where where we try to play a big part in. We say to people that the fit is the fit is obviously you know it's it's an important piece of it, but the build is is also so important, so that we we can understand uh, how the role of the the build is going to play. So if we can't control head weight, we're gonna we're gonna influence obviously the amount of droop via via the head weight. That's going to have some uh, impact on the deflection we get lead, um, and we're going to get some obviously downward deflection. Head weight will play a part in that. CG will play a part in that. So all these things, and, and that's that's part of the build as well, to make sure that flex is consistent. You make sure, never mind flex is consistent, products are consistent. Now, I can't tell you the amount of times I've, I've seen products, and you know we've tried, and, and you know we'll, we'll run through a frequency match, and we'll, we'll even put it in the SST Pure Machine, and sometimes the tolerances in some of these steel tubes are... are not what they should be. I mean, and, and people wonder why they really struggle with a club. And Sorry, Andrew. some of these variances are, are are significant to make an impact. Yeah, yeah. It's um, it, it, there's a lot more to it than first meets the eye, most definitely. Yeah. And and you know, you, you said it already. I'm a big believer that golf instructors need to know a lot more mm -hmm. about uh, the equipment side of the game. We don't ever need to be you, right. um, but we just need to be able to call up you and say, hey, listen, my student's coming to see you. Um, I can't make it. If I could make it, I'd love to be there. But yeah. my student's coming to see you. They hate to hit hooks, mm -hmm. and they typically hit the ball too high. Yep. What can you just work into the fitting? You you do your fitting, but yeah. just know we don't want hooks and we don't want high. For example. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you you had a, you had a really interesting point with Paul yesterday. I think it was Paul when you were talking about the the seminar you done in Sweden. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. you you were talking about you know the the fairway woods and the hybrids and and lie angle. Well, you were leading towards lie angle, but you asked them. How many of you slice them, and how many of you you kind of struggle with the hooks with them, and and that's that's you know something that again is is still it needs to be addressed so much more so that people can understand why they do these things. You know, take Rory McIlroy for example, right? So he's playing this TaylorMade Sim uh, hybrid, has never hit a hybrid in his life. Yeah. Why did Rory get get even get into hitting that thing? Because before they even gave it to him. They put it in their, their club nest, they cranked it flat, and then they gave it to Rory to hit it. Because they knew that a standard hybrid was going to be no good for someone like him. Yeah. So they, they addressed that lie angle that everyone struggles with when it comes to fairy woods and, and, uh, and hybrids. They addressed that before they even gave it to him. Huh, that's interesting. Yeah. That's interesting. Yeah, and, and Paul Wood has shared with me that it's really, um, when it comes to fairways and hybrids, it's the the, the length 
the from front to back size of the club head, if they could actually make them bigger like drivers, yeah. he said they'd be far less uh, likely to hook, far less mm -hmm. likely to hook, which I think is quite interesting. It is interesting. I mean, there's so many things. I, Paul, I can't remember where Paul and I were one day, and uh, we were talking about hybrids specifically. And he shared at the time, and he said, he said he thought that we have still so far to go with developing the right hybrid. And that was quite amazing to hear him concede that, that you know, as an engineer and, a, and yeah. someone who's so, so influential in club design, that he feels like we're, we're, no, we're not there yet when it comes to hybrid. We're, you know, perhaps not there yet with the, the, the correct length for everyone, the correct weight for everyone. One of the things I've seen, Andrew, is that, you know, people treat a hybrid too much like a wood. So they treat it where the shaft gets a little bit too long and it gets a little bit too light. So you make this progression from driver. So you go maybe, you know, 50, 60, 50 in the driver, 60 in the fairway, 70 in the hybrid. Then you go up to, you go up to 100 in the iron. Yeah. And play like a Modus 105 or Dynamical 105, whatever it is. And then, there you go. What, are you playing 105s? Yeah. Right. I'm old, mate. <laughs> uh, and, and when we get that that hybrid there's that hybrid needs I think to or at times could very well benefit from being a little heavier and a fraction shorter so we made a matrix here at TXG of, of heavier and, and shorter hybrids the amount of times I see people turn those over is very minimal now that's interesting yeah yeah that's uh, that's cool um, Ian come on talk to me Talk to me about some stuff. I know uh, you, you wanted to talk a little bit about gears. What are you guys seeing from gears? Um, mm -hmm. I know one of the questions that somebody asked is, um, do you know of any blind spots out there as it pertains to club fitting? Um, and what might they be? What are you unsure of? What are you this, learning from gears? Yeah. Well, I, t I mean, I can, I can certainly address that the blind spot in all club fitting the problem with, with, with how everyone's doing it right now is the golf ball. There's, yeah. there's, there's such a variance in, in golf balls in the market that if you fit someone to a golf ball based on your, your recommendation and then they leave and play a whole different golf ball, the, the, the session you've just had to dial them in it's not for nothing, but it's certainly you're, you're not giving them the exact information that they thought they were going to leave with. Mm. I, done a, I done a test the other day. I was hitting some, some shots. Matt and I were doing some YouTube uh, filming, and I was hitting some seven irons, and I'm a low spinner, as you are. We're both, yeah. we're, we're both sh fairly shallow and kind of shut it down a little bit. Yeah. So, I, so I always struggle spinning seven irons in the appropriate window. So if I, but I like a, quite a firm golf ball. So I've been playing things like TP5X, and I spin that golf ball like 5,200 with a seven iron. Yeah, which is low. It's too low. That's yeah, me. I mean, That's my number. And and uh, in the same test, I grabbed a Mizuno um, RB Tour and spun the same golf ball at 7,200. Uh, sorry, a different golf ball with the same club, same swing. Yeah. 7,200. 7, huh. Right, so and, and that was repeatable. You saw that through uh, multiple shots every time. Wow, every single time. So, when people are looking for the fix from the shaft, the fix from the you know the the club to club, and which one should I use? I go, what, what golf ball are we talking about? Because the variance in golf ball, the window of launch and spin was so different. So, the golf, yeah. the softer golf ball launched Multi three thousand. degrees lower and spun two thousand more. So, the element of friction. Was so much higher that it pulled pulled down the launch to the tune of three degrees. Think of the fittings that are going on out there right now, where people are scratching for three, four hundred RPMs of spin and a couple of degrees of launch. And I'm standing there making the exact same swing, getting an entirely different result. So I really believe that people need to be more mindful of the golf ball they're using when they're fitting. That's a great point. That's a great point. Do you do you guys at your facility and do you guys have multiple golf ball options? Yeah, I carry idea. yeah I carry ten golf balls in my fitting drawer, at any at any one time. Yeah, That's and if great. someone if someone wants to maybe bring their own you know golf ball, and go listen, I, you know I've got I've got a golf ball here. If I don't have it to supply them with and they want to use their own, 
that's that's good by me yeah. as well. And we can we can dial it in, or at the end of the session, or at some part of the session, tell them, listen, you're you're kind of playing the wrong golf ball here. Yeah, this this isn't really going to benefit you. And you know, again, that that's another conversation where please don't choose your golf ball with regards to how far the golf ball goes. Yeah, that's really not what's going to help you lower your score. Yeah, yeah, so 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 true. Then. Um particularly if you hit the ball far enough. Absolutely. Particularly but, if you hit it far enough. Um, without a doubt, Andrew. I mean, there's so many ways in which, you know, we, we, we are going to score better. And I, I've, I've loved this week with, with, your, uh, with you and your guests. And the information, that, and, and the, really the point that I've seen all week is how valuable Arcos is. When you're talking to, yeah. you know, Eric and Sal and Paul and, you know, obviously, just hearing the information that, that Arcos has given fitters, you know, club engineers, coaches, yeah. it's, going, it's going to change your game, isn't it? It, it is. I think I, I really do think that, um, you know, I said to Paul yesterday, I said, Paul, why don't you guys get involved with Ar Arcos? And he said, because I want big data. <laughs> Arcos has got big data, you know. Big um, data runs the world now. There's there's no doubt about that. Um, you know, I... I when we restart sort of uh, the, the sort of you know the business again after after you know obviously things have calmed down here um it will be mandatory that if you have a full bag fitting with me that you will be supplied with arcos off the back of that fitting that's awesome so yeah. so on on the back of that that's built into the price of the fit so that the the clubs that you leave with whether it's we retrofit their own clubs mm. and we tell them they're they're good or, or we maybe send them new ones we want a period of time where we can monitor the, the, those clubs. Mm. And I think at times, sometimes people will maybe not understand why they're doing something. And we, as, as, as their fitters, we want it to be more than a one-time relationship. That's, that's another problem with fitting is it's kind of like, okay, I got fitted, now I'm done. But yeah, yeah. It, ha it has to be ongoing, doesn't it? I mean, very rarely does someone get a lesson and then it's just a lesson. There's not only a follow-up lesson and then there's, there's a progression to that. We don't know what version of you is going to turn up on any given day. So if we see a side of you that maybe is not the everyday version of you, then we want to see what do you do in the golf course? How can we be preemptive to those problems that you're having where I can email you and go, Andrew, I just checked in in your last three weeks of data. Your three way your three would sucks. We yeah. we need to get you we need to get that sorted, you know, come in and see us or recommend an adjustment for it or something. Yeah. Yeah. But that's going to allow us to develop significantly better relationships with our clients. Oh, so such a great idea. And really, you know, to me, that's thinking outside the box and really putting everything with, we are here to help you improve. We're going to go yeah. the extra mile. We're going to do whatever we can that's to right. help you improve. And we're, we might not be telling you how to swing and how to work out and how to eat. But mm -hmm. we are in charge of those clubs, and we want to see yeah. how they're performing for you. Um, that's awesome. I, I'm 100%, 100%, because we, want, we ultimately want them to leave TXG with, with the mindset that that was great value for money. That was a great investment in the clubs. And, and if someone left, and sometimes people suffer in silence. You know, they, they leave, yeah, they, 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 str they struggle a little bit, and then they just go, that never worked. That's yeah. that's at the point where we want to ha we want to be informed about okay how are you doing your scores are creeping up and you know it's rare that that happens but it's, it certainly does it yes. happens time to time that's the reality yeah. so if if we can then come in and you know stage an intervention at that point and go okay hold the bus we're we're going to yeah. come in and help you with this we, we're we here want, for you we're here for you exactly it yeah 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 um, that 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 is great I love that. Um, what are you guys learning from Gears? Um, How long have so you had it? We've had it for about a year, Andrew. Um, okay. So we've been, we've been working at it. We thought it was going to be an addition to the club fitting process. And, and obviously, coming from a tailor-made background, I used to run a mat system um, at, Turn, at Turnbury. And, and the mat system was, was good, and, and it was sort of, there was some good information. But I was always on the... On, of the opinion that it maybe got in the way of me doing my job a little bit with regards to the fitting process. When they get that full the, the body suit with the sensors and they start seeing their avatar swing, I, I can always got the feeling like they're, they're seeing too much here. 
This is yeah. more than data. They're seeing their body and then they're seeing, why does my elbow do that? Yeah. And then at that point, I've lost them to every swing they're trying to hold that elbow in or thinking back to a lesson. We're no longer at that point having a fitting session. We're, we're playing damage limitation on them trying to fix their swing. Yeah. So, so when we got gears, we wanted to use it for a couple of things. Um, basically, R and D. I mean, I think the guys at Ping and, and the guys at Fujikura with their Enzo, you know, machines had have so much information, but there's only two of those in the world. Yeah. So, you know, those guys were extracting unbelievable information. So, for me, I wanted to try and train our team into pre-impact factors. So we all have we all have um, you know, launch monitors where we can tell okay the club was doing this at the point of impact. Yeah. Well, how did it how did it get there? Because if I know how it got there, I can maybe I can influence that impact slightly differently. If I can make an impact on the journey of that golf club into impact, so it, launch monitors are brilliant. But I love to know the pre-impact information as well. Mm. Yeah, for for example. Um, if you look at some launch monitor numbers and you see someone delivering the club two degrees from in to out, yep. but at the start of their downswing, they're right there. 100%. They've now had to go shallow under, exactly. Right? It. Yep. Um, and then you might have a player coming down right here mm -hmm. and they're delivering from two degrees in to out. Um, it's the, and it's the same read, the same measurement, but the force is applied to that golf club are, are so significantly different. Yes. You know, one one will have, you know, obviously significantly less deflection, less grip roll, less grip pressure and twist. You know, and, and things like that make a big role in terms of, you know, the, us going to our shaft wall or maybe going to the loft and line machine and making a recommendation based on how did it get there? So, yeah. you know, and, and we're, we're trying to develop a, a system at TXG where we train our staff in a completely different way from really what I've seen in the industry and in giving them more information and, and more tools in their toolbox to select better parts. Ultimately, trying to assemble the right grip shaft head at the right spec has to come from extracting the right information out of, you know, how did they get there? Yeah. Yeah. I, I love that, Maiden. Can you do me a favor, Fraser? Mm -hmm. okay. Can you can you start to take your show on the road and go to um, England and Australia and South Africa and Argentina yeah. and go and do fitting seminars? Um, yeah. Seriously, there's no reason why you guys can't do it. There's, there's tons of fitters all over mm -hmm. the world. Um, and it's just the case of are they open enough to come and learn from someone with your type of experience and pedigree? Um, mm -hmm. Really, I think that would be brilliant for you guys to do that. Yeah, I know. I mean, it's, it's quite amazing. We're going through such a difficult time right now worldwide and, and we're, you know, we're all really concerned about that. But on the... On the other side of that, it leaves us with opportunities and, and so to do things we wouldn't normally do. So I get to this time of year normally, the early part of our season up here, and normally I have a booking list between four and six months long. So, yeah. I, you know, I know exactly. Right, it's going to be more left, more mm -hmm. lobby, more left. Yeah. Um, and, and I see so many golfers making that mistake in that yeah. they don't understand you're not swinging this club with as much velocity. Yeah. There's not as much droop, uh, and as a result, you don't need the same lie angle to carry on through up from your seven iron all the way through to your 58 degree. Correct. Um, you, and you, it's got and as an add-on to that, Andrew, is, is the, the shaft has progressively, so it's worth using, say we're using Modus 105, any stepped shaft. So as those steps progressively get you know to the point where our, our tip section is, is shorter, the shaft yeah. is the shaft is getting stiffer. Now the shaft is getting stiffer to offset the the, the sort of um, increase in head weight, but yeah. we're we're swinging them slower. The shaft is getting stiffer, and that lie angle is retaining its sort of toe up position through impact. So we need to be so mindful of the progression. I actually, done a I done a gapping session right before we um, we kind of you know closed our doors here, and 
for the first time ever, I'd done basically what was close to an absolute linear um, lie angle progression. So the player really had the club toe down with a four iron and had it up with a wedge. So he needed his four iron about three degrees up and he needed his wedge about a degree flat. So by the time we went through his, his whole thing, it was like 62, 62, 62. I mean, <laughs> it, it, was, it was crazy, but we're working off of ball flight and ball flight yeah. always, always is king. And, and it, you know, yes. that's, we have to be, we have to always make sure that we're not trying to, um, you know, satisfy a, 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 a piece of tape on the sole of a club when it comes yeah. to lie angle. We, we've evolved beyond that. You know, we know that the lie board isn't going to give you all of the information. Now, if it's the only tool you have to measure that sole interaction, you know, it'll tell you something. But we've seen enough cases where that toe is down, the ball goes left, the player, the fitter makes it more upright because they want to get that sticker back in the, or the marking in the middle. And then they're hitting snap hooks for fun. Everyone's got that experience of, of that set of clubs where they're yeah. the handle raiser, but they're also the guy who shuts the face and then the fitter goes, oh, you need two degrees upright. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, and that's why you guys have to get your information out there, mate. You, you got to stop that kind of thing because I know. Um, really, ultimately, it, it, it's, I just want golfers to not have bad experiences when they yeah. deal with professionals. So true. Um, when they go and take a lesson, when they get a fitting, when they get a fitness evaluation, yeah. um, they need, there's no reason why. And a lot of people have been saying uh, in the comments I've read, we've learned so much from your YouTube channel. And that's cool. Okay. Mm -hmm. But yeah. what percentage of golf teachers and club fitters mm -hmm. are even on social media? I know. And I'm telling you, it's way less than you think. Okay, it's way less than you think. And so there's yeah. a massive volume of people out there that are not seeking out better information, yeah. that are not listening to Ian Fraser and watching these lockdown learning sessions um, because they don't really care. They just yeah. keep doing the same thing they've always done and they stick to that. And, um, and we've got to somehow get into their, their medium where mm -hmm. they're going to hear about us, they're going to learn, and now all of a sudden they come to that PGA seminar because they need CPD points, and they go, wow, that's different. <clears throat> I've never heard that before. 2001, I think, was my first... 2000, 2001 was my first year in the PGA program uh, in the UK, and I remember being down at the Belfry and being at the, the club. I think they called it Equipment Technology was the module at the time. And the guy who was taking the class, and this was in the early days of aftermarket shafts were just being introduced. And yeah. this was sort of, you know, a, a session on, on shafts and aftermarket shafts and stuff. And the guy stood up and, and started to tell us about Fujikarma shafts. And, and at the time, I, I knew a little bit about it. But, you know, I'm going, this is the guy teaching at the national level. And he's calling these shafts Fujikarma shafts. And I mean, he, he doesn't know what's going on. And, and this is it. This is the national level where, where the best of the best are going to try and make it through these uh, these sort of diplomas or degrees or whatever it is. And you know, just just at that level, we need to do better, Andrew. Yeah, yeah, agreed. And, and and we're never going to be able to reach everybody. Yeah, we're never going to be able to reach everybody. But no. I know we've got to try as many different mediums as possible. And and. We tend to, those of us who live kind of in the social media golf world, mm -hmm. we tend to think it's everybody and it's not. It's, yeah. it's a small slice of the pie, it really is. That's right. um, there's so many older golfers who are just happy that they can figure out email, but they don't know what this Instagram thing is or anything. You know, they're no. happy with Facebook and email. Um, yeah. And there's a lot of people we still got to reach out there. So um, true. Yeah, I wanted to get a little bit from you um, on putter, putters. Mm -hmm. um, one second, Andrew. Um, so, I mean, again, Quintic has been our sort of our monitor, if you like, for for putting, and um, nice. we we still see so many people leave the store, and and the putting has been the number one takeaway for them. So their ability to choose the right one is there's still, again, the right information is, is not out there for that. 
So when they select a blade versus a mallet, you know, they're, they're doing that based on, you know, one felt better. I hold a couple of putts with, with one and, and I missed a couple with the other. That's a good choice. Yeah. But when, you know, when we're able to dig into that a little bit more and help them, you know, with their putter selection, I mean, again, you know, I've, I've been listening to, to the guys this week and Paul had some great nuggets on putting last night, didn't he? or yesterday. Yeah, I listened yeah, to it yeah. last night. He had some great, great nuggets on that. And, you know, with regards to the influence of, of launch and spin and how much does it really matter uh, on the on the makeable putts, mm. you know. But I think understanding that when you select a putter, not all three degree putters are made equally. You know, I have I have a couple of putters in our matrix here actually, so I have about a fifty putter matrix, and on either side of the scale, I can basically take one putter that has three degrees of loft that launches, you know, it launches plenty plenty high enough and one that doesn't launch at all and based purely based on cg location so if i take a a, a tightless futura 6m the one with the two weights at the back yeah i keep that in the matrix for the guy who leans the handle a little bit just a little bit of that kind of handle dragger he gets too much top spin yeah. he really really struggles to launch it his distance control is really poor because he doesn't get the the lift of the golf ball and when the greens are a little shaggy and dewy in the morning, he struggles with his pace control. He, he might be three or four putts more that day. But when they go to a, a putter that can launch it up and out of that, their distance control is so much better. Then their miss on that 40-footer is a foot and a half rather than four feet. Yeah. You know, and, and those things those things make a, make a difference to the confidence. You know, they sure. make a difference. They, they have big impact. So that's one. Um Certainly, putter shaft is is a, an emerging part in in our what, industry. What's going on there? What, what are you seeing there? Well, when, when the guys are measuring putter shafts, what they see basically as as the head weight has progressively got quite a lot heavier. So we were using 330 gram heads not that long ago, but it's not uncommon to see 420 gram heads now. So yeah. the in, the impact on that from a shaft perspective is it creates this sort of fish hooking of, of the of the shaft so the head starts to kind of toggle back and forward yes yeah yeah and we know the tolerances on on a you know a 12 foot putt we have about a degree of leeway either side of that hole and if, if we sort of are open or close that putt over a degree we're going to miss it outside that hole with the same mm. with the same stroke so when we have the inconsistency in delivery that the shaft can play a can play a fairly significant role in that especially depending on the tempo of the player. So I was talk to, talking to Dr. Paul um, Hurrying about this, and yeah. he, he was saying even, even the best players in the world have a really difficult time. Never mind the best players in the world. His test robot has yeah. a really tough time uh, replicating launch angle based on the variability of the shaft. So he can, huh. is, he can isolate everything. From face angle, he's got it down to about 0.2 of a degree. And he, he can control all these other variables. But the one thing that he can't even control in his test robot is launch angle. Because the variable with regards to what the shaft is doing. Very interesting, eh? Very interesting. So, so companies like, you know, BGT, Breakthrough Golf Technologies, um, you know, them. And there's a few other companies. You know, Odyssey Stroke Lab gets confused with, with kind of that technology, but it really isn't. You know, it's, it's a very yep. different thing. It's, uh, it's obviously designed to, to counterbalance the shaft a little bit more. It doesn't really impact the, the flex of the shaft and the, and the contribution of that. So I think we, we've got a little bit of, uh, of learning to do with the implications because take a putter shaft. And, and what, what is a putter shaft? It's a, a really, really inexpensive steel tube that's, that's put into a putter really regardless of, of the flex of it, regardless of the head weight. Yeah. No Any one ever it. thinks about that. Yeah. No one, and and it's the club that we are we're dealing with the tightest tightest margins with. So are we are we you know bastardizing the whole thing by giving it zero contra zero influence? Mm. So I think I think we have stuff to learn you know when it comes uh, when it comes to that. Um, mallets and blades I think are misinterpreted. I think people think um, a, a, a mallet will. Um, 
a mallet will sort of be good for the player who has a straight back, straight through stroke, and then the, the blade is good for the arcing stroke. Mm. What matters is what does it get to at impact? Never really? mind never mind whether you've got yeah. an arcing stroke or a back and through stroke. What does it do at impact? How many degrees of rotation per second are we dealing with here? Are we, t- are we talking about someone who really rotates? Well, that's good because we can put you into something that slows that rate of rotation down. And something that's great and Quintic is measuring the, the journey of the putter head pre-impact, at impact and post-impact so we can see that journey in a bigger window. Because I mm. want to know that rate of rotation so at the point of impact I can influence the face to be within those tolerances we talked about. Blade length plays a massive part in that. Huge. Mm. Um, you know, things things like that. So that the, obviously the, the, the head sort of the way the head interacts with the axis of the shaft, huge, absolutely massive. So I, I think we, again, we have, we have more, much more to learn on that. Mate, I've got to say, just been listening to you, I'm excited for our profession. Uh, I'm excited for what we do. We just got to get a chance to get out there and do it. I know. I know. Um, really, it's, uh, it, it is so exciting. I love what you guys are doing here. Um, it's something I, I'm so, so pleased to see you guys doing it and taking the bull by the horns and saying, listen, we're mm-hmm. going to dive in, we're going to learn, yeah. we're going to be leaders. And that's really right. what you guys have done. Um, you've said we're going to be leaders in this field mm-hmm. and uh, we're going to do what we can to help golfers and we're going to yep. do what we can to help uh, to help people. So I, I love to see it, mate. It's cool. Thank you, pal. And, and you know, I can honestly say that, you know, for, from my perspective, you know, I've learned an awful lot from, from you with regards to that, all the way back to our first interactions back in 2012, 13, out on Long Island. And yeah. even then, you know, the research you were doing, you were doing that stuff because you knew it was it needed to be done. There was no social media. You weren't doing it for selfish reasons to, to sort of enhance your brand. You were doing it because you were curious. You yeah. were looking for more information to deliver sort of better lessons to your, your yeah. students. So... I mean that that really rubbed off in, on a, a young version of me all those years ago, and it more. still does today. Thanks, mate. Thanks, mate. All right, hey, more. Um, everybody, I want to encourage you check out TXG uh, Tour Experience Golf. Um, pretty soon, they're going to be coming to a PGA or federation in your country. <laughs> <laughs> this is my hope. Um, Really okay. They've got some great information. If you haven't seen them, please give in a follow. Give TXG a follow. Check those guys out on YouTube. They do amazing work. They put out some good so stuff. Really, and it's uh, interesting. If you're a geek golfer and you're watching this, and if you are watching this, I promise you, you're oh, no. a geek golfer. 100%. You will appreciate so these guys. Because uh, in that time, it was all about like kings and lords cool and stuff. higher people. Uh, Ian, thanks like, very much. Uh, like a so by the way, just, just as a note for everybody, and I people am think that recording some this. Gave well, him. I will record this. There's like a bunch of theories, but people think that Instagram some people... Story. So I'm going to put it every, with everybody all the gave rest him of the their lockdown learning books series and stuff, on my YouTube or that channel. There's a bunch They're of different people that wrote it. It wasn't the just moment. Shakespeare um, wasn't the other ones from today. <laughs> That would be amazing because I would think all these smart writers and literature people would be able to discern. Well, that's what Mr. Lance said. There's no way that there were people back then that could write that well. There's no way there's multiple people that could write that well. You're the best, mate. Keep it up. Thanks, pal. Appreciate the opportunity, Andrew. Yeah. Love on that lady and that call. 100%. And let them know. I think it's definitely one person. I mean, I think. Thanks, pal. Can't forget about the boy. Because Shakespeare was the one who put on the plays. Yeah. So 